Welcome back to another edition of the Quantum Yoga Podcast. I, I cannot wait to introduce today's guest, Dr. Gary Schwartz, who is a professor of psychology, medicine, neurology, psychiatry, and surgery at the University of Arizona and director of its Laboratory for Advances in Consciousness and Health, uh, has published numerous books, uh, over 450 scientific papers, you're involved in countless organizations and have been at the forefront of consciousness research and study for decades now. Uh, what an honor to have you on the program. Thanks for joining us. Oh, my privilege. Thank you for having me. Uh, I wonder if you could maybe tell us how, just as we start, before we, as we go to this deep dive of all your projects, can you talk about this initial transition from uh, your, your doctorate and the early work that you did after that to jumping all the way over into these um, <laughs> areas that, not, that are not studied very much. Was it, was it a jump or was it, was it a, a meander over there? Well, if I remember correctly, your radio show is called what? It's the Quantum Yoga Podcast. Yes. Well, you could imagine, you know what a quantum leap is. Yeah. I would have to say there were mul multiple quantum leaps. It was as if I were jumping from one electron shell to another quantum jump uh, to sort of get where I am today. But very briefly, I was uh, a mainstream academic psychologist and scientist with a background in electrical engineering. Um, and physiology, I had I was raised in a um, conventional, uh, a religious home to essentially atheist parents. I had no spiritual experiences, as far as I could tell, growing up or any spiritual awareness. All through graduate school, when I was at Harvard, and certainly from my early Harvard years, and then my Yale professorship years. Um, and I did, I did quote mainstream, even though it was at the, you know, it was at the leading edge of research. It was in areas like biofeedback and meditation and so on, all of which I, I greatly enjoyed and felt a privilege to be part of. And it wasn't until I reached probably between 38, age 38 and 40, because um, I have a, I have a sort of a hobby and passion for quantum physics and uh, bioelectromagnetics and so on. And I began to, uh, and astrophysics, and I began to see that there were certain, the best I could say is uh, uh, failures of my education to account for certain phenomena that were being reported in quantum physics on the one side and then astrophysics on the other side. So, you know, you have things like entanglement or uh, wave particle duality and the role of the observer in uh, the quantum physics side. And then you have at the level of astronomy, the discovery of super clusters of galaxies and um, the fine tuning of the universe, which suggested that there was much too much order in the universe to explain that it could have occurred by chance. And then I started having personal experiences uh, particularly in the realm of of synchronicity. In fact, I recently published a book called Super Synchronicity, where science and spirit meet, where I where I started confessing all of this data that I've been collecting initially in my personal life and then other people's lives, where the probability of these events occurring by chance was so infinitesimally tiny that I was forced to entertain the idea that there was some sort of a guiding, organizing, designing process, some sort of a supermind, some sort of universal consciousness, um, one mind, as Larry Dossi called it. Uh, and so the, uh, this then opened me up to these other realms. When I moved to the University of Arizona, um, I then on the one hand became exposed to energy medicine and energy healing, which I found initially almost impossible to believe but then began doing research in it and found out, including double blind studies and so on, and found out there was a real phenomenon there. And then on the spiritual side, spiritual psychology and spiritual medicine, 
particularly in the topics of uh, areas of life after death and a greater spiritual reality. And that's probably the work that I'm sort of most well known for in the public is the work on life after death. Um, I wrote books called The Afterlife Experiments and The Sacred Promise and more recent book at Atheist in Heaven with uh, Paul Davids and um, where, where I was forced to the conclusion that, uh, that our consciousness and our energy was like the light in some stars. It continues long after the star has, quote, died. And therefore, the whole notion of what is the universe and who are we and how do we, how do we uh, think of ourselves and the world and the universe, I ended up, if you would, taking a much longer view. Mm-hmm. Um, and that then led to the, uh, the creation of what's called the Academy for the Advancement of Post-Materialist Sciences. The website is called aapsglobal.com. That's aapsglobal.com, which is a, an attempt to bring scientists actually all over the world together and students who are interested in the, in the fundamental nature of consciousness and its, its non-material basis um, and all the implications that that has for both science and uh, you know, our personal lives. Anyway, that's the broad sweep. And at different times, I've been kicking and screaming to have to fight the, 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 the education slash biases that I was raised in uh, to, set, to let them go uh, so that I could be open to this greater reality. Yeah, and it's interesting that you are uh, not only are you kind of existing or coexisting in this world of academia, but you're you're thriving in it by bringing these these uh, normally uh, sort of taboo topics into that into that environment, and th- that's that's absolutely fascinating that you've been able to ride that line. And is it because of the scientific rigor? And the scientific method I that allows say, for that. I would say that's it's virtually entirely because of that. I, I, I typically describe myself as a, quote, boring scientist. And what I mean by that is I'm absolutely rigorous about the experimental method and being conservative about drawing conclusions and um, using the tools of science and scientific thinking to approach problems. When I had my NIH fund, it was called, uh, from the National Center for Company and Alternative Medicine, it was called the Center for Frontier Medicine and Biofield Sciences. Biofield Sciences, Frontier Medicine, by the way, was their term, NIH's term. So it didn't mean cowboy land, it meant really frontier. Um, mm. the, uh, I used to say that what we were doing was applying mainstream methods to frontier questions. Mm. And it's because I sustained that commitment to science that my academic colleagues tolerate me and some of them actually respect me <laughs> and the uh and also you know i'm i'm not a youngster anymore in the academic world and so i i have the the relative freedom to pursue these topics as long as i have funding and as long as i'm doing it rigorously um that m- unfortunately most junior people or even young senior people, you know, people who are even recently tenured, don't have the freedom to be able to do. And I think it's partly because my colleagues see me as, you know, old enough uh, so that if I make a fool of myself, um, you know, I'll be retiring soon anyway. So uh, (laughs) I'll tolerate it. But uh, is most of your work now at um, the laboratory advanced consciousness is this lach is this most of where you spend your time matter of fact interestingly this year and next year which is the first time ever i'm taking um two years off from teaching uh i bought out all my teaching requirements so i could work full time on the most uh cutting edge uh dean radin author of the new book, um, Real Magic. He, he calls it the bleeding edge of science. Um, uh, devoting virtually all of my time, I would say 80 to 90% of my research 
time and writing time to the possibility of developing um, a working prototype for technology to enable us to communicate with quote spirit with yeah. people who have transitioned. Um, I have called it quote the soul phone. That's a, a, the lay term for it. In fact, um, if anyone in, in listeners is interested, they can go to a private foundation that was created to help foster this work um, by two individuals who deeply care about it. Uh, it's called the Soul Phone Foundation. And if they go to soulphone.org, S-O-U-L-P-H-O-N-E.org, it'll take them to that website and they can see some of the latest research that we're doing. Yeah, well, this is one of the topics I wanted to cover with you. Um, I did hear a partial lecture that you gave on it. And uh, I, we're very much about in this, in this conversation on our podcast, very much about technology integration and what's going on there. Uh -huh. Um, and also did interview uh, Dean a few weeks back about this book. And so it would be a good segue to, to talk to us more about what this is and the different you've got, I'm look, I'm on the website now reading through it and I'm like, yes, more please. How do we, <laughs> how do we get involved? Wow. Okay. Well, the, the earliest work that I did that I published, was back in 2010 and 2011. And at that time, um, I was using, uh, and still am in the optical area, but in this case, I was using what's called the low, uh, it was called the silicon photomultiplier system. The silicon photomultiplier system was then a relatively new technology that could detect single photons of light in a pitch black environment. So you can imagine how exquisitely sensitive that is. And um, a single sensor cost $2,500. Uh, the software was not user-friendly to say the least, to use in biomedical imaging. Um, and I wondered whether we could use that technology, place it within a box, within a box, within a box, a triple box, so it was completely dark, and then invite our, our uh, members of our quote, A team, our hypothesized collaborating spirits, HCSs, specific members, to when requested to quote, go into the box and see whether we could detect subtle increases in light that they would be, um, were predicted to be emitting uh, based on various theoretical considerations. And because we could measure precisely the amount of quote, noise, if you would, it's called dark noise, by collecting lots of baselines, you know, we collect five minute baselines and then interspersed we would invite specific hypothesized collaborating spirits to quote, go into the chamber. Um, the, uh, and what I observed in multiple experiments was that you could measure reliably um, in terms of statistical significance, measure an increase in photon counts picked up when they were invited to be in the box versus uh, the baselines. And we did various kinds of controls such as um, because one of the first questions is, well, how do we know it's not the mind of the experimenter? Because the, the experimenter knows when the, when the alleged spirits are going into the box. So we would have did an experiment, for example, where we asked the experimenter to try to imagine putting his mind in the box to see whether or not his mind could potentially produce the effects. Um, and it turned out, for example, that that um, did not happen. And we found that certain spirits were really good at doing this, and we could get statistical significance for individual spirits. And then we had one of our hypothesized spirit collaborators, um, see whether he could use this as a possible communication device, i.e. signal yes versus no with the technology and, um, and obtain positive results. And that, that, those set of experiments were published in the journal Explore, the Journal of Science and Healing that Larry Dossi is the executive editor of and Dean is one of the um, uh, senior editors on the journal. Um, and one of the major questions was, but how do we know still that somehow it's not involved with the conscience or energy of the experimenter? And I realized that in order to prove that to myself, let alone to anybody else, we were have to, going to have to get rid of, quote, people altogether. And as you know, with our contemporary technology, like a, our normal uh, smartphones, um, we don't have to be present for the phone to pick up a text message or, or pick up a phone call, record that information, and then later we can come back and download it and see what was there. 
And so I reasoned that if we were really dealing with these hypothesized spirit collaborators, and I published all this mediumship research with evidential mediums that indicated that some of them were real, not all of them were frauds and so on, and that there was clear evidence for uh, intentional beings uh, being part of this research, um, that we could theoretically run the entire experiment by PowerPoint, including the voice of the experimenter, and even use even more sophisticated um, imaging cameras. And we should be able to get results in the middle of the night, run by the computer, giving the instructions about when to go into the chamber and not um, with controlled baselines, uh, when no human being was present. In fact, we were sleeping. Um, and we did those experiments. I don't want to take a lot of time to explain them now, but the bottom line was, much to my amazement, we got positive results. Um, and we got positive results with two of our, you know, our star collaborating uh, spirits. We now call them our people like this or beings like this are quote test pilots because they are they, they're really committed to doing this kind of, of work. Um, and so it became clear to me that that you couldn't explain this as being uh, due to the minds of the experimenter for all practical purposes. I mean, parapsychologists, you know, to be to be fair. There are, I'll call them extreme parapsychologists, they propose the possibility that even though, for example, I wasn't running the experiment, and even though I was, quote, sleeping, sleeping, how did I know that my mind was not going to the lab in the middle of the night? And my unconscious mind was producing these results, fooling me into thinking, and fooling everybody else into thinking that it was actually spirits from the other side, as opposed to my mind. And the answer is, I can't be 100% sure that it's not my unconscious mind. All I can say is that my conscious mind can't do any of this, and it seems, until somebody can prove that my un unconscious mind can do this, it's much more parsimonious, particularly when you combine this spirit communication technology research with mediumship research and with near-death experience research and past life regression research and after-death communication research and so on, that the most likely explanation is it's really our spirit collaborators. So that's how the work began. And I then secretly, but partly because of intellectual property reasons, but partly also because the university wants to you know, have some say in all of this, but also because um, we wanted to go for the gold. Meaning, I wasn't interested in just getting statistical significance in publishing papers. I mean, that that would be fine for most people. But I really wanted with um, various colleagues, including my wife, who coincidentally um, and ironically developed mediumship skills her, herself. And she's science minded, so I could literally study her as she developed those skills. And then we could do this work collaboratively. Um, so she became a member of the team. Was it, for, uh, for me in particular, it wasn't, the idea of having this technology was not simply, and it's not an unimportant goal, to reduce the, the need for grieving between parents and children or people and their spouses or their parents. Because if you know that you can, not only that your loved ones continue, but you can maintain a relationship with, the, with, the, with, the, with soul texting, we call it, and eventually, you know, full, you know, soul Zoom or soul Skype. I mean, if, if, if the technology is going to get to that point, then the only way that we'll ever get to that point is to work toward it. Um, we have to go from statistical significance to practical, right, uh, success. The metaphor that I use is the Wright brothers. You know, a little over 110 years ago, there were no airplanes. Nobody has succeeded in, in having powered flight. And it was December 1903, at Kitty Hawk that five people witnessed the Wright brothers' first flights. The first one lasted all of 12 seconds, the longest one was 59 seconds, and the plane crashed and they had to rebuild it. I mean, the plane had no windows, it couldn't, you know, it had no distance, and it was utterly impractical. We couldn't use it for anything. But for the five people who were there, they now knew that flight was possible. So it was proof of concept that something was possible but it wasn't at the level of quote a working prototype, I mean that you could use it practically. So if we're gonna have like a, if you're gonna be texting on your phone, for example, it's not sufficient for it to be 70% accurate. 
even though that would be nice from a statistical significance point of view. Um, I'm sorry that my house phone is going on. It'll, it'll go up momentarily. Um, but the, uh, the idea that if we could get it to the point where it could be 98% reliable or 99% reliable, then you would have, quote, a soul switch, for example. You could then create a soul keyboard, and all of a sudden we could go from proof of concept to a working prototype. And so for the past few years, that's what we've been working toward. And the level of technology that we're working on now is so extraordinarily sensitive. So for example, the very latest technology that, that I've been devoting the past six months of my life to, um, I mean, it's not the only piece of technology that we're working on, is we're trying to see if we can measure predicted increase in conductivity, that is electromagnetic field effects and or electron flow in hypothesized collaborating spirits when they, quote, could, are part of an electrical circuit. So for example, if we take uh, uh, two pieces of metal and we have, they wire them with a battery, i.e. a voltage source, controlled voltage source, and then we turn that voltage on and off, um, if, the, if, the, if the plates are, are spread apart, there'll be virtually no current flowing between them and you won't see any changes. But if you and I then touch the, the two contacts, current will flow through us, even though we have relatively high resistance, uh, uh, typically a, a mega ohm, a million ohms if we're touching it, or if we put electro gel or put saliva on our hands and then touch it, might go down to 100,000 ohms. Nonetheless, there's a, there are milliamps of current that go through us and we clearly, uh, we complete the circuit. And you can measure that very, very easily. And it can, it can turn on a light. You can use it to do almost anything. It's a quote switch. We also pick up all kinds of signals. We're an antenna, including for 60 cycle noise. And all that gets picked up, it goes through the circuit. So now the question is, instead of us doing this, what would happen if our spirit collaborators did this? Could they, quote, complete a circuit? Well, if they were going to be completing one at all, it's not going to be milliamps, which are thousands of an amp, or even microamps, which would be a millionth of an amp, or even nanoamps, that would be a billionth of an amp. You'd want to go down to ideally what's called the femtoamps, mm. or even what are called atoamps. And femto is one to minus to one followed by 15 zeros. So it'd be 1.0000000000000. I don't know if I said 12 or 15, one amps, <laughs> yeah, femto amp, or one with 18. Well, is it possible to measure that? Mm -hmm. The answer is yes. It's just that the equipment is typically only used by elect, you know, electronic engineers. A femto amp meter costs, on the average, now about $10,000. <laughs> you have to have a super shielded environment in order to pick yeah. it up. I mean, you know, you, you're really getting at state of the art sensitivity. But the point is, the technology is there. And so, if you, if you can mix, it's not that we have to invent technology. What we have to do is take advantage of what currently exists and then creatively apply it to the hypothesized, you know, to the hypothesized spirits and the associated theory. And then the question is, do we just get statistical significance again, because we've gotten this over and over again, or can we go from statistical significance to working prototype? Yeah. And that's the journey we're on right now. It's amazing. Well, I've got a million and a half questions for, Go for it. all that. And my first is uh, in regard to your your quote test pilots these 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 two beings that scored very high in interaction. How how does one then? So uh, can you def firstly can you define those beings a little bit more for us? Uh, are they? I'll just leave it the question there. 
Yeah, okay. So in other words, am I willing to identify any of our test pilot people? And the answer is I'll, I will share the name of one of them. Um, I confessed him uh, in a book that I wrote called The Sacred Palmas in 2011. And most people haven't read that or gotten that far in the book, so they don't know it, or they dismiss it as ridiculous. I mean, by the way, there's such a large boggle factor in all of this work. There's the kind of boggle factor of, well, could these people, beings really be here? And then boggle factor of, gee, why would they want to do this? And then boggle factor about, well, can they really collaborate? And then boggle factor of, can you really measure them reliably? And then boggle factor of, oh my God, what would it mean if you really could? You know, we, and we can talk about some of those. But anyway, the person that I confessed is someone with, that when I refer to him with initials, I call him HHH. And that stands for Hypothesized Harry Houdini. Now, AKA, we call him Harry. Um, now, the, uh, you could say, okay, well, gee, how did Harry Houdini potentially get involved in this research? What's he doing working with you? And how did you as a serious, boring scientist come to the conclusion that this really was quote Harry? Right. And why are you now um, comfortable um, in, uh, in living with that evidence. I'm, not, I'm never comfortable about talking about it because people immediately raise their eyebrows. I mean, it's understandable, but I can't help, I can't help the facts. Um, and, and this is not, quote, fake news. This is not alternative facts. This is real scientific experiments and data. Um, and the brief story about how, quote, Harry came into our lives is that um, it's partly personal, um, meaning that there was a colleague who was working with me in the lab, whose name is Dr. Robert Steck. Um, he worked with me for about four or five years and then moved back to the East Coast. And Bob is a, was a retired, is a retired psychologist, PhD psychologist, who had an interest in parapsychology. Um, and then when he retired, he wanted to work with me. And it turned out he was a uh, Sherlock Holmes aficionado. So much so that he is a, actually a member of what's called the Baker Street Irregulars, which is a by invitation only sh sh Sherlock Holmes club, okay? And, and, and they have a journal and everything else. And he really cares about Sir Arthur Conan Doyle uh, and had a real, you know, emotional connection to him. And, uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes, I'm not Sherlock Holmes, but, um, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle had a close relationship with Harry Houdini. And they had a, a feud uh, because uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, we call him um, Arthur, um, you know, he uh, was, uh, he came to the conclusion that spiritualism was real and that some mediums were real and you could detect this. Whereas Harry, who wanted to believe in all of this, was so, uh, what's the word? more than disappointed, he was really furious by all the fraudulent, fraudulent physical mediums in his day, and there were many, and he uncovered them, that he ended up uh, con concluding that they were all frauds. And so you had these two people who both cared about the possibility of life after death. One was convinced it was real, and one that was convinced that it wasn't real, okay? And Anyway, because I was doing research with mediums, gifted mediums, um, Bob also participated in research. And as this work tends to unfold, people that you have real connections with often show up. Anyway, to be a long story short, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle came through mediums, and also independently, Harry Houdini came through mediums. And so the first thing it started with were research mediums in the laboratory spontaneously reporting the presence of Doyle and Houdini. Now, Houdini was a hero of mine. I mean, uh, even more so than, than Doyle was. And um, so the idea that the two of them might be interested in this work according to these evidential research mediums was curious to say the least. Um, and, you know, Harry Houdini was very skilled with his hands. He practiced for hours and hours doing things. And according to mediums, 
he wanted to see if he could affect the physical world. He wanted to participate in our then secret research. So that's how it started. And so, I mean, just to ask a very rudimentary question here. So identified himself as in some way, identified himself through a medium that you were testing that this is Harry Houdini. Multiple mediums, that's correct. Okay, wow. Just so, like they identify your grandmother, your deceased grandmother, your deceased um, father or a deceased child, the same way that they on the other side would identify themselves through a medium. The same thing happened with, in this case, Harry Houdini. And so your- and that's how it started. Yeah. So the level of communication, the level of accuracy, the level of uh, significance at which these two beings that you're referring to are communicating is much higher than all of the others. And well, so, the, yeah, well, the, uh, the, the person I'm speaking about, Harry, he was in the first experiment, the first silicon photomultiplier experiment. He wasn't in the second one. He was then in a whole series of the third ones, which, I, which is under review in a journal. Um, I hadn't uh, collected the data a few years ago, but I'm only recently publishing it. So I just want to be clear that don't want to get confused here. But, the, so, but getting back to your question about, yes, are some spirits better at this than others? The answer is yes. But there's two different kinds of technology here. There's the technology, which was what we were doing earlier, where they had to learn how to use the technology. Mm -hmm. So it was more like biofeedback. So for example, I set up a system which uh, using a super sensitive magnetometer measuring very tiny magnetic fields. And then I enclosed it in what's called a mu shielded chamber. So that shields the sensor from external magnetic fields. So if you take a magnet and you put it up in front of the, the, the sensor, it goes crazy. And then you put the crazy meaning, it's, it's very sensitive. You then put the um, shield over it and it shows no effect because the shield really blocks it. You then ask Harry, and then you have the, you have the output of that system, that sensor coming through in real time like a biofeedback device. So you know, you're getting magnetic field system and you have, you have it set up so that the noise is, that most of the noise is quote, below the level at which point it triggers a, a, a visible response. Then you say, Harry, can you learn how to use this to make this produce responses? Now that took trial and error learning. So he went from not quote, being able to do it at all to eventually being able to produce about 70% accuracy. Uh, the reason that we didn't continue with it was he never got beyond 60 to 70%. Now, by the way, if a basketball player made 60 to 70% of his shots, he would be an all, be, he would be a super superstar. The average basketball player gets less than 50% of his shots in, and they're the superstars. So, it, this took a lot of training, it took a lot of work, and the average spirit couldn't just walk up and affect it. Now that's different from the technology that we're now trying to develop, where we want it to be something where you don't have to use have virtually any training to use it. You just have to do simple things. Yeah. So just like you don't have to have any training to make yourself conduct electricity, all you have to do is put your fingers on the contact and the rest happens automatically. Yeah. What we're trying to do is to have something where, as long as the spirit can put their fingers in the switch, they don't have to have any skill other than putting their fingers in the switch, and the rest is going to happen because of their, you know, their, uh, you know, soul biofeedback, full biophysics, or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, and, and that, and that's that's another question that uh, I wanted to get into was that. This, all of this communication is happening within the electromagnetic spectrum. This is electromagnetism uh, and not some other type of energy that is, that is uh, being used to communicate. Well, everything that we've been doing is working within the, broadly within the quote, electromagnetic spectrum. And what I mean by electromagnetic, 
light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And we're doing some very sophisticated things with lasers, um, detecting very subtle changes in both reflection and absorption. Um, but the, but everything that we're doing is, uh, is very sophisticated electromagnetics. That doesn't mean that there aren't other forms of energies that they are not involved with scalar waves, for example, or something else, or phenomena at a level of the quantum level, which, uh, which go beyond conventional physics. I'm completely open to that. It's just that we have to work with the technology that we have because we, you know, and, and again, I talk about the metaphor of the evolution from the cell phone through the smartphone to what we call the soul phone. You want it to work with an electronic device. I mean, our goal is to, is to give spirit a voice. Mm. And that gets back, by the way, to which I didn't really make clear before, but I should say so now, that what's inspiring for me is not just, as I said, helping maintain relationships and foster increased love and compassion and, and enhance the people's recognize the importance that love is eternal and therefore it, it, it continues and so on. But that if we really knew that all of this was true, that we could then potentially receive guidance from luminaries, be it Albert Einstein and David Bohm or, uh, or Mother Teresa's or Jesus Christ or, or famous entertainers who cared about healing the world like Michael Jackson. You know, each of these people have individuals that, whose ear they would, people would listen to them if they spoke. And now they know a lot more than they did when they were here. And so it would be truly a transforming technology if these right beings had the opportunity to communicate with us. Well, you sound very optimistic about the progress that you're making so far with this, uh, with this technology integration uh, and you're, you're, you're committing the next year, did you say two years to diving into this? So yes, I, I, I'm finishing the, I'm just finishing the first year of this two year pull out all the stops in terms of my time certain colleagues' time and um, research finances, you know, to do this. Uh, the, I am optimistic, uh, I am optimistic that at least we will have taken it pretty much as far as technology will allow us with a level of commitment, that's why I called the book The Sacred Promise, a level of commitment, quote, from the other side to us, they're the A team, we're the B team, you know, to try to work collaboratively to make this breakthrough. So, we, you know, we, it's, we call it the, the breakthrough project, for lack of better words. Um, I'm very optimistic that we're going to be able to do, you know, take advantage of the very best hardware and software to do this. Whether we go from statistical significance to a, a, a plane that can prove that it can fly to something that you'd actually want to fly in, something that we could actually do, <laughs> that I, I don't know. I, to be honest, I, I don't know. I wouldn't be spending all my time and energy on this if I didn't think there was a serious probability mm. that can happen. Okay. But, you know, right. again, the boring conservative scientist says, We'll give it our best shot. Can we can we uh, sidestep to your your publication, the super synchronicity, for for just a bit of the conversation? Sure. Uh, and I would love for you to absolutely ju just give us uh, sort of the broad strokes of of that manuscript for the listeners. Sure. Um, synchronicity, um, another word for it, is meaningful coincidence is when two or more events occur in close proximity in time that are highly improbable, uh, typically occurring together. But um, when they occur together, um, and if they're particularly meaningful to you, you interpret it as something that was potentially, quote, meant for you, some, some some information, some guidance, some um, signal, some feedback. And 
it was made, uh, became quote famous with Carl Jung. And there were many books written about synchronicity. Um, probably the, the leading current book is by a man by the name of Bernie, Bernard Beatman, Bernie Beatman, Bernie for short. Um, and he wrote a book uh, called uh, Connecting with Coincidence. Uh, it's a fantastic book. And he has a radio show about coincidence. I've had the privilege to be on the show, I think twice now. Um, uh, now, there you can have pairs of synchronicities. I call that a type one synchronicity. We have two events. You can have what I call a type two synchronicity when you have three to five events occur uh, in, in close proximity. And then you, you can have what I call a type three event. And a type three event or a type three synchronicity is where you have six or more events in close proximity, all of which are in the same general content area or theme area. And the more of them that occur in sequence, the more improbable it becomes. Because in, in statistics, you, you multiply the probabilities of each of them to determine what's called the conditional probability. If you have six or more, um, then it becomes really special. And I use the term super synchronicity, like physicists talk about super clusters of galaxies or superconducting uh, conductors or superconducting computers. Um, the uh, that that same principle. Now, how did I get involved with that? Well, it started with the synchronicity. So, very briefly, I'll give you a quick little story. I was a professor at Yale, and I'm very mathematically oriented. I at this point had no awareness of things like life after death or greater spiritual reality and not in any serious way. Um, I was doing mainstream research, but I discovered that, as I describe in the book, there were too many, quote, 11s in my life. And it was a statistical anomaly. So, for example, my office was 1A, and the A, of course, is the first letter. Um, and my office was around the corner from... Um, uh, Kirkland um, Avenue, and it was spelled K-I-R-K-L-A-N-D-A-V-E, it had 11 letters. And I had to take um, uh, exit 56 to get home, which added up to 11, which put me on Route 1A, which was the same as my office number, which was 11, to arrive at my house, which was 326 Colonial Road, that added up to 11. Um, of course, in the state of Connecticut that had 11 letters. And, and my birthday was June 14th, which added up to 11. And my then license plate, for example, I don't know what it was, but if you took the letters and converted them to numbers and then took the numbers, you added them all up, they added up to 11. And there were all of these 11s, now one or two or three or four, you know, it'd be one story. But I, I don't remember how many there were. Um, there were probably 10 or 11 of them, but there were so many of them. <laughs> and I realized that they were, they were too many. And being a scientist, of course, I didn't know. Maybe that was common. Maybe that just happened to people. So first of all, I, I would start asking people to, tell, to look in their own lives and see how many 11s they came up with or how many other numbers came up with that, that related to their phone numbers and their license plates and their house numbers and their birth dates and so on. And in the probably 50 or so people that I sampled, no one had the string of those events like I did. And of course, it made no sense to me at the time. And I essentially ignored it. And then other weird things happened of other kinds of synchronicities, which we don't really have time to go through now, um, which followed that realization which ultimately forced me to the conclusion that this was not a random event, that it was, that I needed to think about it. And that's what started me on the journey. Now, and so then I became a synchronicity watcher. So in fact, I even created a website, uh, not a website, uh, an email, a separate email address, where I would send synchronicities and put my synchronicities in there. So I could keep a running total of all these synchronicities as they were occurring. And I was actually moved to start writing the book. Um, uh, the first draft, I think, was in 2011 or 12 or something like that, um, when I had had, had charted over 100 
type three synchronicities. And the, of course, the immediate question is, well, are, are you, is it simply that you're fishing? In other words, you, you know, if, if, you, if you look for the number 11, will you find it? Or if you look for synchronicities involving roses or ravens or dragonflies or whatever the event is that happens to be going on at the moment, um, if you just look for them, will you find them? And the answer is, if you don't look for them, you'll never find them. <laughs> so you have to be open to seeing them. But, uh, and I've done this with students for multiple years in my psychology and religion and spirituality class. If I ask students to look for 11s or look for dragonflies or look for ravens or look what, for whatever the particular event is, um, you never see spontaneously that level happening. If it happens at all, it, it happens extraordinarily rarely. Um, so then, of course, the next question people ask is, well, how come you have so many of these? Um, and, I, and by the way, part of the reason is because, I, because I'm open to it. But part of the reason I think, and this is the conclusion I sort of came to in the book when I gave a whole series of these illustrations. By the way, I've had these kind of super synchronicities with well over a hundred individuals, which I named their first names in the book. So it's not just me by myself, but people will come to me with, with events that we'll be talking about, which just happen to be. So if, if ravens are happening in my life, somebody will then walk up to me and tell me a raven story, you know, or whatever the case may be. Um, and I, again, keep track of all the people that's um, involved with. But I think because because I cared so much about the data and because I was seeking evidence from the quote universe that there was an active process going on and because the universe would know that I wasn't doing it for quote selfish reasons, but I was really trying to discover something unique about and special about the universe that most of us don't have the privilege to pay attention to or know about. I entertain the hypothesis that the reason so many of these synchronicities are called come to me through so many different people um, is because my intentions to receive them were um, honorable ones and they were for the best and highest good. So there was some higher spiritual reason for the the fact that I seem to be wealthier in having these events more than others. And did you, were you able to distill that into, uh, into a why, why, why that, why that was going on? Um, well, my working hypothesis is that there is a greater reality. By the way, I should explain that I've just co-authored a book with Dr. Mark Pitstick called Greater Reality Living, which talks about all of the evidence for life after death and a greater reality and how we could consider changing the way we live our lives as a function of this knowledge. Um, and the, I think that because I'm so passionate about the phenomena and about understanding it and sharing it so that others could potentially enjoy this aspect of the universe if it if they want to co-create with it um that so if there is this universal mind this you know larry dossie calls it a one mind i wrote a book called the god experiments um in 2000 and six, uh, where G-O-D stands for Guiding, Organizing, Designing Process. And the subtitle is How Science is Discovering God and Everything, Including Us. I think it's because of my um, genuine desire to understand this and to make it possible for others to have it, that that's the primary reason why I'm having it more than the average, certainly. In fact, in the book, I, I said, you know how, uh, what was it, Bill Gates, um, you know, one of his dreams was for there to be a PC in every home. Remember that? And um, my fantasy is that, is the dream 
that everyone could experience super synchronicities in their personal lives and their professional lives as well. Mm. And is there, uh, did you, did you find a, a methodology for teaching that or for uh, f- helping people tra- train synchronicity? It's a different, it's almost like a different flavor of intuition in a certain way. Uh, it is a, di- you, but it's a very good way of putting it. Um, it is a form of intuition in the sense that I've become ever more sensitive to, for lack of a better term, I'll call it nudges, Mm. you know, called Mm. feelings that I should Mm. go to a certain place or pay attention to a particular license plan. I'll give you a trivial example, Uh, trivial and not so trivial. Yesterday I was driving home and there was a license plate in front of me and it said M-O-M-M-A-C, Mom Mac. I never seen a license plate before it's called Mom Mac and I don't, and I pay attention to license plates. I pay attention to virtually everything. And I was saying to myself, gee, that's going to be, that's important. I was feeling that somehow that's important and I should take a photograph. And I'm saying, why should I take a photograph of Mom Mac? Because I do take photographs of, 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 of synchronicities. So I didn't, but it was, but it, it felt like it was important, but I ignored it. Um, now I should explain to you that that day I had a, a conversation with the the person who is the director of the circle of trustees for my laboratory. Um, her name is Jennifer Horner. And she has a she's a lecturer in in the engineering school at the University of Arizona. Also, is a is some sort of a program uh, director of management role for their online programs at the University of Arizona and. And she made a comment to me in a conversation we were having about uh, about wisdom, and she used the term infinite wisdom. Uh, could you imagine an infinite mind that had infinite wisdom? I said, you know, that's a really interesting term, infinite wisdom. And then this morning, I had this insight about, I don't, when I say I had this insight, uh, the more appropriate way to say it is, is that this insight popped into my head. So I had this experience when I was musing, if you would, with the universe, of the notion of universal wisdom. And I never thought about the notion of that if there are universal principles, there could be universal wisdom in living a universal life. And so I wrote about that this morning. Okay, so I wrote some notes about this. Then I, uh, I exercise most every morning. And I exercise typically by watching car restoration shows. Hmm. They're hobbies. I I love beautiful cars and seeing people take transport things that are all beat up and ugly with all the machinery and everything else and and transforming them into things that not only work and are functional, but also beautiful. And um, the, uh, I then um, was watching the program and then I, I exercised and then I turned the the DVD off and uh, the to a local cable news network, I mean, a national cable news network, and a commercial comes up on the screen, and the phone number is something like eight hundred eight 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 um, age wise age wise now age wise you know it was a phone number how often do you see a phone number wise i mean it just doesn't happen and then i looked over and it was for a website for moms Hmm. how often do you see a website advertised with mom in the website Hmm. so here i have i have a wisdom experience in the morning i then see a phone number that says age wise and then it's attached to a website that says mom in it and all of a sudden i said but yesterday i saw a license plate that said mom mac there's a there's a there's a process of learning to pay attention Mm -hmm. to subtle significances and 
if you're living your life as most of us do, filled with the day-to-day -day emergencies or stresses or whether it's bills or kids or foods or whatever, you know, and we go from one thing to another, to another, to another, we don't have the time or the energy typically to even allow, to be aware of coincidence, let alone to be aware of the nudgings mm -hmm. that might guide us. I, I wonder if your, your background in biofeedback tuned you to this sensory awareness uh, only because, I, you know, while you're talking about that, and I'm also sort of thinking about some skin conductance and heart rate variability studies that I've recently come across, and old stuff, but, you know, that I've, uh, th for me, is, I've recently become aware of, and this interoception uh, quality, right, where people, um, there seems to be a way that one could train awareness of that sensitivity in the body to feedback to feedback to us of a certain kind you know the that is such a creative thought and i hope you run with it and let me let me honor you with uh, i really do want to celebrate that idea at two levels number one i think you're right that my that my proclivity to being open to this kind to subtle feedback in part grows out of the fact that I did at least 10 years of research in biofeedback. I was one of the quote, grandfathers of biofeedback. You know, I was president of the Biofeedback Society of America and helped found the biofeedback. I mean, I was really involved with all that work um, and still have a passion for it as a phenomena. Okay. Um, and that may have in part led me to become more open to these subtle feedback. But secondly, which is more practical, is the idea that one could facilitate the direction, the development of, in, of, in, of being able to sense subtle nudging from the universe, the subtle, by, by learning to be through, through an integration of, quote, biofeedback training, maybe combined with meditation training and so on, that you, if you could increase the awareness of the subtle cues, would that translate into improved ability to, for example, to experience super synchronicities? Mm. I mean, that's a testable hypothesis. Mm. And also something that it would give people an incentive to become more in touch with their feelings. That's a very good idea. Thank you very much for that. Wow. Okay. So, um, I heard you mention, we looks like we just have a couple of minutes here, but I heard you mention in an interview uh, when you were looking, I believe it was some pictures of Hubble and creating a meta hypothesis for this order that exists in our, our known universe as a sort of background mechanism for how the synchronicity is operating uh and then you made a so i wonder if you can just maybe give that to the listeners a bit because uh. that's so fascinating and then you made a comment as it relates to electric universe theory and i'm bringing that additional thread in simply because we had a a guest on uh wall thornhill talking about electric universe and that may give us a bigger broader model to of understanding here well, thank you for bringing that up and reminding me that I did that. I mean, that interview presentation was recorded and it should be in, I, at some point, I, I really have a responsibility to publish it. But the one minute story was that, and I've now forgotten, because it's been a while, so forgive me, I, uh, I don't remember the precise name of the image. So the, your audience will have to forgive me. But it was an image that was taken with the Hubble telescope where they pointed into an area of space where allegedly there were no stars, I mean, no stars in the, visual, in the visible, that you could see with the naked eye or with normal pictures. And then they had it exposed for, a, I can't remember, was it 11 hours or 11 days? I can't remember the details, but it was a very, very, very long 
accumulated exposure. And when they did that, they not only saw, they, they uncovered, again, I don't remember the numbers, 10,000 galaxies or something like that. I mean, it was a space that you thought was empty was actually filled with all these galaxies. And it was the single biggest piece of landscape of the, of the universe that had ever been uh, uh, photographed. And I've always you know, wondered, well, is the theory correct that the, 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 that the galaxies are distributed randomly or just, just like there are quote super clusters of galaxies, could we find a hidden order in that seemingly complex set of quote random numbers that would imply that in fact it was not random but in fact it was a far more sophisticated painting or tapestry than any of us ever imagined and then using some actually relatively quote simple conceptually simple statistics but using sophisticated image processing software to be able to do the calculations. Lo and behold, I discovered that there was a hidden order in that image and that there was then another image that was taken in another area of space that didn't have the same number of galaxies. And then I looked to see whether using the same procedure I could uncover that cover an order and discovered evidence for an order. And you see, that level of order, quote, can't happen by chance. Because the more data points you have, if there's complete independent of events, the more you will get a normal distribution. That's how, quote, statistics work in the absence of connection. But if there's connection, you, you, you can't get pure randomness. And the only way to have structure is for something to create the conditions for structure to occur. Because um, otherwise you're talking about, unless you want to take the, the hypothesis, which some people believe, the quote, multiverse hypothesis, which is really there's an infinite number of universes. If you have an infinite number of universes, you have an infinite amount of time um, that you could then have that. Uh, uh, you might get one universe by chance that would do that. But there's no evidence for an infinite number of universes. We don't have enough knowledge of what's going on in our own universe. It, one of the observations that you made, I believe, was that they look very much like uh, neurons, dendrites, uh, the this sort of physical construct of the human nervous system. I, I believe you made that, or someone else, whoever was interviewing you, made, made that connection. And, and what sounded so interesting to me about that, not only was that is that almost like a fractal pattern in a way, but also that I think I was reading this Penrose, Roger Penrose uh, work on qubits being captured by microtubules and that there are more microtubules in neurons and dendrites because of the geometry of dendrite. You know, I was not bold enough, or brave enough to overtly make that similarity. Um, but I did cite an example where people were looking at strings within the galaxy, and it really does look like very similar to the kind of st string structure the, that we see within, within the human brain. Um, uh, the level of statistics that I did was not enough to justify that, that mm. draw that conclusion. Again, I'm being a boring conservative scientist, but if you ask me to speculate about the possibility that that order is going to be a fractal rep replication of uh, the, what, that, that the, the kind of meta complex structure that our, our dendrites capture in their uniqueness that that could be that that could be a if you would nonetheless a micro of the macro of the connection of galaxies in the universe. Um, I would be forced to entertain that hypothesis. Mm. Dr. Schwartz, thank you for your time. Uh, 
how can listeners support your work and uh, continue to keep up with what you're doing? You have some online online ways for people to yes. connect. Yes. If they're interested in the soul phone work, I encourage them to go to www.soulphone.org, S-O-U-L-P-H-O-N-E.org. If they're interested in the movement in science to go uh, to consider what's called post-materialist paradigms, including the apparent primacy of consciousness in the universe, I strongly recommend and encourage people to go to the uh, www.aapsglobal.com. This stands for the Academy for the Advancement of Post-Materialist Sciences. Um, I have personally not kept up my own uh, uh, website, you know, in terms of my own name and so on. Uh, but hopefully this summer I will, if I have some time, I'll uh, bring it back into its current form. But there's, but there is information on it of the work that we've done, at the, and that's uh, uh, www.drgaryschwartz.com. Uh, 